moving on, Matthew Fisher, <laughs> is, uh, who's the head of the New York office of the Congress, also the head of the, of the, the U.S. office. He also writes for the Congress. He just uh, wrote a book called The Road for Burning. What do you think about these things? Okay, I've been told I wasn't allowed to promote it. Can you just say whatever comes through your mind? So I won't talk about the road to the road, the path on 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 the road. And I won't talk about financial capitalism in my earlier book, which was inspired by, in part by David Baldwin's excellent book. So it's just, oh, there he is, it's a fantastic book. Um, I've been moderating today a conference for The Economist um, about corporate citizenship, and I just wanted to share three thoughts from that. Um, the first speaker was Jeff Swartz, who is the CEO of Googleland, uh, who's an incredibly inspiring CEO, and has really, at Timberland, I think, pioneered, in many ways, uh, sustainable production techniques for, and they have you know, recycled rubber soles on the boots now increasingly. Um, he led, uh, I think, one of the important initiatives in that industry, which was to bring together all the competitors, sit them around and say, well, what can we all agree uh, not to compete on? Uh, things like standards in the supply chain to make sure that, for example, all the leather that was being used, uh, you know, tanning is a famously environmentally destructive industry, so they all agreed to common standards on tanning and so forth. So very, very inspiring. Um, and he ended with this comment that he, I asked him, what's the next stage for corporate citizenship for a company like Timberland? And he said, we're going to go into the public square. We actually want to start, you know, we've, we've changed ourselves internally, we've adopted all sorts of sustainable practices, so now we want to take it into the realm of politics and start talking about this stuff politically. Um, and he got a good round of applause, and everyone liked this idea. At the next panel, um, the discussion quickly turns to the Supreme Court's recent decision, uh, which many of you will be aware of, to uh, give um, corporate, corporate uh, corporations the right to free speech, the same protections that we have as individuals are now being extended to companies, um, which, uh, you know, I guess will allow Timberland to go into the marketplace of ideas and to campaign politically, which on the face of it is a good thing until you start thinking about all the other companies uh, that might also start doing that, um, and what they might be arguing for. Uh, we had two more conversations that I want to raise with you. One was um, a proposal was made that, uh, in fact, that Bill Clinton was the final panelist, and he said, well, um, Interesting, in two states in America now, uh, people have, have formed companies which they are trying to run for elected office in America um, on the basis of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, and it's not clear which way that's going to shake out. He said they have the advantage over ordinary politicians, but of course they are available 24 hours a day, uh, they don't need to sleep, um, and uh, I guess they can outsource a lot of their work to Bangladesh or Bangalore or somewhere like that and uh, get it done very cheaply. But I think there are real challenges that uh, this Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, throws up. And the final conversation was had was that, well, what do we actually do about this? Are we going to, um, can, we actually, can we actually get companies to disclose all, all their political donations, all their political involvement? Can we ask companies now in future to actually state public policies what is our attitude towards government? What, what, are, what is our strategy? What are we prepared to do? What are we not prepared to do? Can those uh, policies be audited and so forth? And I really, I wanted just to talk about that very, very briefly to draw it to your attention uh, because I think it could go one way. You could imagine a responsible company like uh, Timberland playing a very positive role in politics. You could imagine a lot of other companies playing a very bad role. I think this is going to become one of the most important uh, issues about the future of our democracy over the next few years, which is going to be what does what, what role does corporate power play in shaping the society that we live in? Now it has full political power thanks to the Supreme Court. So I want to stop on that note. I don't know which way it goes. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Thank you. Given your position as editor of the Economist, 
you know, like like you shared, we, we talked briefly about this uh, earlier. You know, why is your perspective on the world economy, the U.S. economy? Are you an optimist, pessimist? You know, what are we in for? And the social part of the way you talk about. Yeah, so my new book is The Road from Ruin, How to Revive Capitalism and Put America Back in Top. By the way, Arnold um, Huffington chose his book as the book of the month, so just wanted to... Great, well, thanks. It's good. I can promote it afterwards. So, I mean, we're, trying to get, we're trying to get as much people to debate topics about how do, we improve, how do we improve our business system, how do we improve capitalism so that it actually works, rather than leading us to the kind of mess that we've got at the moment. So if anyone wants to blog about that, just uh, let me know if you haven't already got that. I'll be posting your blog at matthewbishop.economist.com. Um, so I am, I, I think that uh, what happened two years ago when Lehman Brothers failed and the governments of the world had to bail out the financial system, that's a defining moment in our generation um, in the same way that the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall was, earlier the Vietnam War, Second World War, Great Depression. It's a big generational moment. And it's not at all clear to me at the moment which way it's going to go, whether we're going to look back on this moment as a moment where uh, we peaked and it all kind of went into a long decline, certainly for the developed world, or whether it was a moment where we realised that our capitalism needed to be upgraded for the 21st century and we took the hard decisions we needed to take. And my book is talking a lot about what we need to do uh, to improve the system. And my worry is that at the moment there's a lot of very tinkering sort of approaches, no real deep thinking going on, um, and there's a real danger that, uh, and as we were talking about earlier, you say it's the best case scenario that we end up like Japan in the 1990s. For me that's probably the likely scenario at the moment, less real hard decisions are taken, but we could easily go um, a long period with no jobs being created, no real growth, unless we really grasp the metal and make tough changes. So that, that's where I am. I, I, but I do think, I do think um, and Clinton again said this today, that if you bet against America at any time in the past 200 years, uh, you would have lost your money. Uh, because every time people have been predicting the dream of the American system, we found some surprising way to innovate. And I guess the reason we, uh, my co-author and I titled the book what, the way we did with this, how to put America back on top, it was only partly to sell copies to Fox News readers, but it was also um, <laughs> it was really about that belief that it is fundamentally uh, necessary that America, America is still the light of the world in many ways as a, an image of what a country ought to be, despite its many efforts to destroy that image. And you know, we, we do believe it can come good again, and that the world needs it to. So that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. What do you think the bailouts? Do you think they were a good thing? Do you think they helped the economy? Do you think ultimately they weakened things? I think they had to they had to do it and the worst decision that was taken was the decision to let Lehman Brothers go bust. But all the evidence of history, and one of the things we do in the book again is look at every bubble, uh, crash, recession, depression, going back to tulip mania of any significance that we could find, is that when you let the banking system fail, uh, it, it's like letting a bomb off uh, in a crowded room. It's really much more destructive than any other kind of bankruptcy. And so they should have found ways to nationalize it or something to stop it actually going bust, but to punish those in charge and then to sell it again or something. But the way they did it, Paulson's decision, I thought, was absolutely reckless. Um, and he, you know, the fact that he's going around now saying how he saved the system. Well, yeah, so you make a problem bad and then fix it again. I'm not quite sure that's a great achievement. But, yeah. So you, you raised a huge constitutional issue that I don't think has been discussed since people talk about enacting Article 3, which is a revolution in the Constitution, and bringing out the Constitution to amends to revoke the Constitution. We now have corporations that have, in certain cases, relatively unlimited money available to them to kind of vote these up as they see fit. What is kind of your gut initially right now? as to where this might go moderately and where this might go awry. Well, I think you've got, to be, you've got to be worried about it because I think already, you know, you look at what's happening in Congress and there's real gridlock. I mean, you, you take a, an issue like health care reform where there's a clear mandate for the president to do something, but the lobbying really has made a mess of that. Uh, you look at um, financial reform, where I think the view that Wall Street 
but still has massive lobbying power is right. You know, you look at someone like Chris Dodd, the senator who's leading the financial reform, and he took, you know, a special deal mortgages from Angelo Mozilla, the CEO of Countrywide. So, I mean, how can you have discredited people like that at the heart of the system that's still receiving lots of money from these companies? So, I think it's a real constitutional challenge uh, that we have to figure out. Well, we don't talk about the thing, because the only thing that changed is now corporations don't have to disclose. There's no campaign finance reform in that. You're you still limited on what you can give. No, but have you seen the job? I, no, I, no, I have. The, the, the difference is that, that they can now take ads that have political issues that specifically say our candidate is the right candidate for the job. Vote this guy in, and they can use unlimited money to advertise that. Right. But that's that's the change. Right. There's no, did I miss something? Else? Did I miss the metal? The, the, just... the change is also the change is also this that we can take the corporate peon and run the corporate peon. That's fine. I might. Oh, you, I, what you're saying, I, mean, I think what, there was already a very, very powerful trend that this is the final, to my There's no argument. I'm just, I'm just asking that we're all talking about the same thing. Like, this yeah, is, this the is the final, this is the final stage of that process. I actually think the Supreme Court is explicitly able to endorse exactly. okay. candidates and policy positions. And the, the but not paying any more money to their PACs, not paying any more money to their PACs. Well, I mean, I this is direct, this is direct, this is beyond that. This is direct advertising money. I know because it just came into my system. I mean. I run the local television uh, trade association, the Emmy Awards. It's all local TV stations. And we had like a big office party nationwide after the Supreme Court decision because it's like big money's coming in the system. Corporations cannot take political ads. Of course. And that's all it was. It, was, it wasn't that the politicians are going to do any better. It said, I can give, go get myself an extra probably something. I think it opens up a vast. billion and a half dollars worth of political money. It was awesome. But that was it opens up a vast <laughs> area where, where companies previously say, Stay back and we'll now feel they can go wherever they want. Like. Charlie, that was the original intent of the question. Matthew, yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious whether you're concerned about the possibility that the U.S. dollar will no longer be the, the currency of settlement and what the implications of that are. Because I've, I've been watching that steadily and it's a concern for me. Well, I mean, for, for, for one of the things we argue in the book is that. Uh, one, that this is a global crisis. You reflect one of the causes of this economic crisis being the vast imbalances in the system. China making all these currency reserves and then lending them back cheaply to America. And that, that actually reflects the dollar-based global system that we've got. And so one of the solutions in the long run is to move away from the dollar as a reserve currency to some new global reserve currency. It's a very technical right. issue, but I think I think it's in America's interest and the world's interest to get off the dollar as the If you look at what happened when the pound sterling was no longer the currency of settlement, historically, Britain went into a tailspin. No, I think it was the other way around. Britain was into a tailspin. Okay, but if you don't want to take it, they clung on, on, they they on way too long to a whole load of economic That's policies true. that were against the world's interest and against British interests. My worry is that America will play the same game. It will, okay. it will try and pretend that China and India and all other economies aren't becoming important. And it will try and pretend we don't need to change the rules of the world economy. And it will end up realizing that all that stuff will happen anyway and you'll be left, uh, less influential than you would have been otherwise. Yeah. One last one? Or yeah, one last question. I think someone in the back. Yeah. 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 Last Friday, I had the opportunity to uh, be your uh, last leader in town speaking. You just uh, published a new book, or a book called uh, uh, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. And you know, the basic claim is that in the situation today where there's so much corporate money going to support all these uh, interests, only somebody like Bill Gates or uh, Warren Buffett and 15 other individuals can, if they think that these are important issues, put their mind behind opposition to these corporate issues. He actually made it very seriously. And that was one of the most interesting part of yesterday. Well, yeah, I actually had, a, I had the, the pleasure of actually interviewing Ralph Nader on stage uh, last, uh, last uh, spring, and uh, last summer, and he, and he does believe that, I, I mean, I think the book is unreadable. It's basically uh, 800 pages of very detailed blueprint of how you would change all sorts of issues around the economic and political system here. But, but his broad point is right, that actually, you know, you need, that, that with a bit of money and the, the sort of campaigns that he's suggesting, you could change the American political system in a way that 
um, addressed some of these issues of lobby power and corporate power. And he actually wrote a book um, with Mark Green, who's you know, the perennially losing mayoral candidate <laughs> in New York. But, um, they wrote back in the, the early 70s on uh, corporate power in America and, and what needed to be done to make corporations properly accountable. And that book, I think, in many ways is still accurate in its diagnosis and some of its proposals. And I think Nader went off in all sorts of other directions after the 70s, but when you think back, he actually wrote for the Economist in the 1960s, and he published his first article criticizing the motor industry for its safety record uh, back in the Economist back in the 60s. And I think in that sense, he was profoundly influential with his notion of you know, making companies properly accountable for citizens and consumers in a way that maybe we need to re-channel his spirit, maybe in a different form using social media or whatever else now. But we really need to take this issue of corporate accountability seriously so that we can actually, I mean, I'm not anti-corporate at all. I just think that you know, we are all capitalists in terms of our savings are invested in companies, but we have no control over what they do. And they, they really ought to be more accountable to us um, who invest in them and who uh, rely on them. And they're not. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This actually concludes the one part of the evening, so we'll be back to you having drinks, being married, and chatting with speakers. Enjoy yourself. This lasts as long as you want to last.